All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Friends, there is a power at the very center of your being, so great, so wonderful, that it staggers the imagination even to try and think about it. It is the power of this thing called life. It is in everyone and through everything. And today I am going to discuss the way this power works for us and how it is that the resources of divine energy can fill our lives with health and with happiness. Ideas really control our destiny, and today we are going to talk about using them. Ideas really do control the world, for the world acts the way it thinks. And what is an idea? It is not something you eat or drink or wear. An idea isn't a physical location to which you go. An idea is a thing of thought. Today we are familiar with the term ideology as it applies to individuals and to groups, both nationally and internationally. The struggle that is taking place in the world today is a drama of ideas which lead to human conduct in the life of the individual and in the life of the nation. And ideas are contagious. They start in the minds of individuals and groups and gradually spread until the whole world is influenced by them. For instance, Jesus had the idea that God is right where you are, that there is a law of good available to you wherever you may be. It was his idea that the kingdom of heaven is at hand here and now, and may be entered into. It was this idea that made him different from others. He gathered around him a few simple people who accepted this idea, and they gradually spread it throughout the world. His ideas were ideas of love, of unity with God, of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man. In our day, Mahatma Gandhi has influenced hundreds of millions to believe in a spiritual force in our lives. Our forefathers conceived the idea of a nation bound together by mutual consent through a code of laws and ethics, which we call constitutional government. Our constitution, with its amendments, is a grouping of ideas conceived in the minds of men of great mental and great spiritual stature. The Declaration of Independence and the Constitution of the United States are the two greatest human documents ever written. They really are ideas leading to ways of living together under laws which everyone agree are for the greatest good of the largest number. And just as there flowed out of the ideas of Jesus, the whole philosophy and conduct of Christianity, so there flowed from the ideas of our ancestors something which has produced the most nearly perfect system of human living that the world has ever conceived. Henry Ford had an idea of a mass-produced automobile, crude in its beginning, but out of it comes much of our modern transportation. Franklin had the idea of catching power from lightning, and men like Edison and Marconi and others perfected this. Today it wouldn't be possible to live without them. Always someone pioneers the field of ideas. Our laboratories are places where people work them out, and every advance in science is the working out of an idea. Every invention starts with an idea in the mind of the inventor. Every novel represents the creative idea of its author. And your life and mine are made up of our ideas. Ideas that ride into action through our conduct. Yes, ideas really do control the world. How necessary it is, then, that our ideas should be sound, that they should harm no one and do good to all. Now just where do all these ideas come from? We say they come out of the mind or they come through our thinking. But do they really come out of our mind? Or is the individual mind a channel through which something greater works? You see, ideas are more than something an inventor thinks up. They are something he really feels out as though he were thinking from nature herself. 
This is a conviction which many inventors have, that ideas exist in the universe and we pick them up or draw them out of the universe as though we were surrounded by an infinite mind which knows all things and which is always pressing against us, trying to acquaint us with these ideas. Personally, I believe this is the truth. But there must be a way through which these ideas come, and there must be an intimate and a personal relationship between the universe and each one of us. Emerson said that every man is an inlet to the mind of God, and because he is an inlet, he can, if he wills to, become an outlet to it. As a great man of science once said, we think the thoughts of God after him. Suppose we take the attitude that God is right where we are, that the mind of God that contains all ideas isn't some far away dream, but is a present reality. If we are surrounded by a mind that knows everything and a power that can do anything, how are you and I going to make our thought a channel through which this mind may flow out in the things we are doing? We should start by accepting that the same mind that creates everything is creating through us and that we may use it. This would have to be a fundamental conviction with us and we should have to have a positive faith in it. We should have to develop an imagination that thinks of the universe as being alive and awake and aware. We should have to accept this in the intellect and feel it in the heart. The imagination plays an important role if we wish to live creatively. And we should couple imagination with faith. We should believe that the answer to all our problems already exists in the divine mind, and we should act as though this were true. To feeling, we should add faith, and to faith, we should add works. We do not wish to become merely false dreamers, idle dreamers. We want to make our dreams come true. We all wish a more abundant life. So let's see how this would work out in actual practice. Suppose someone were to say to you, I don't feel that I am getting much out of life. I find myself more or less alone and friendless. I don't think I'm much of a success. And I find that much of the time I am depressed and unhappy. Now, if you wish to help him, you would begin by explaining that he isn't unhappy because of the laws of nature. He already accepts that they will work for him or for anyone. He already has a faith in the invisible powers which hold everything in place. Next, he should come to realize that nature never lacks anything. This thing called life is already filled with limitless possibilities. He is surrounded by a creative mind which flows into everything and into him. He already believes this about other laws of nature, such as the law of gravity, now he has to add another idea to his conviction, which is as simple as this. His mind is connected with the mind of God. He belongs to the universe in which he lives. It wishes only what is good for him. It wills only that which is good for him. Moreover, it knows only that which is good for him. And just as he has learned how to use physical laws, so we can learn how to use mental laws and spiritual laws. The physical laws are already here, and the mental and the spiritual laws are already here also. You will have no trouble in convincing them of this, because you have used an illustration that is definite, easy to understand. You are using an illustration which his will and his imagination and his feeling all can agree with. You are going to show him that he is surrounded by a divine intelligence, which, if he lets it, will flow through him. Nine times out of ten he will accept this, but he may add, in spite of all this, I do feel myself to be without inspiration. I do feel alone in the world. I, I am discouraged. I don't know just how to live successfully. Now, you must arouse his imagination to a point 
where he will be willing to experiment with himself. So you're going to say to him, just imagine yourself to be exactly what you would like to be. Try to have the same kind of faith in the guidance of divine intelligence that you have in the laws of electricity. Say to him, look about, and you will see how intelligence governs everything. You can see that there is an infinite mind holding everything together or nothing would be here. And you must make him feel that this mind is his mind now. He has a partnership with it. He must establish the same faith in the reality of this and this infinite mind that he has in the reality of other things in life. You are arousing his imagination so that he will feel this and know it. And now you must arouse his will so that he will act upon it. Instead of thinking of himself as poor and weak and unhappy and forlorn, he is going to imagine himself to be successful and happy strong, radiant, and alive. You must arouse his imagination to the acceptance of a power greater than he is, just as all forces in nature are greater than he is. There are mental and spiritual powers, and he is going to use them just he would, as he would use other powers in nature. You will have to convince him that belief and faith act like a law. They are laws, and they follow rules of their own, just as definite as other laws. You're going to show him how to use his imagination and feeling to play a new role in life. He's going to set up an ideal for himself and mentally identify himself with it. And when thoughts come to him that deny this, you are going to show him that if one kind of thought produces a certain effect, the opposite thought will produce an opposite effect. You must teach him to have patience within himself, as though some inner guidance within him takes him by the hand and lifts him up when he falls, as though some wise counselor within him says, this is the right road to follow. He will have to have patience within himself and gently, though persistently, acquire the habit of controlling his thinking. I venture to say if you do this, and he follows the few simple rules you have laid down, and you help him over the rough spots, it will not be long before there will be enough proof of the truth, truth of what you are saying to build up that great hope within him, which is necessary to all achievement, to build up an expectancy which has learned how to believe in a power greater than he is, and how to use it. And whether you are doing this for you, your own self, helping someone else, you will find it the most exciting and interesting thing in your life. And in helping someone else, you will discover a new possibility and a great truth that we are made both to live and to give.